Here's what you're missing over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. From the Gettysburg Museum of History Studios, you're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Addressing Gettysburg. And today we have a new old friend of ours. Uh, this is his third time on the show in one year. Insane. No one has done that before. Well, actually, um, yeah, probably, yeah, so. probably. probably so. like Tim Smith, I think. Has. <laughs> We've had a few. But anyway, we love people who come back regularly because uh, it just gets better with each one. And uh, the person I'm talking about, of course, is Greg Elder. And Greg is here to talk about changes that come out of the Civil War, changes in society, military changes, changes all around, ch 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 changes from the Civil War, and that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so tired. Please I'm, don't I'm, do that again. <laughs> 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 I'm getting slap happy here. Or what, a punch drunk, whatever it's called. Anyway, welcome back, Greg. Thank you very much. So today we're talking about these, uh, all these things that come out of the Civil War and uh, change. But let's, let's start with, um, bef can we, let's start before the war, okay? Um, the, the, the big war that we had prior to the Civil War was uh, the Mexican War. And um, compared to how the Civil War was fought, how much different was the were the tactics of the Mexican War? So they had started to transform, but we were still fighting predominantly with with non rifled mm. non rifled muskets and all. So we it, that 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 was still far more Napoleonic than than when you get into the the Civil War, where you know that first Battle of Bull Run. It, it, it truly is a transformational moment where. Everything goes up in the air. All of our expectations, everything that we think um, should happen the way that it is, uh, doesn't doesn't go the way it's supposed to. You know, McDowell sending artillery forward. You know, this is the way Napoleon did it. We're going to move the artillery up right in front of the enemy, and, and of course they get shot shot to pieces. And the range of the, the the that they were fighting, although it's closer than most people think. You know, a lot of people think Civil War fighting was happening two, three, four hundred yards, and you might start firing then, but really it's it's one hundred to one fifty. But that's still close. That's still further they're out um, than, than, you know, most of the fighting, like in the Revolutionary War, which is really, mm. you're talking 50 yards, yeah, um, roughly ridiculous. 50 yards away. Um, so, so the Mexican War is, is it's still truly far more Napoleonic. And, and you got to kind of forgive the, the guys who fought in that war, um, kind of forgive them. You say, well, look, how many of the veterans of the, the, the Mexican War went on to be, you know, major figures in the Civil War? Um, and yet, when they get there, they don't necessarily in the first few battles of the Civil War shine very brightly. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because things had changed. And and the other part to that is, of course, in the Mexican War, uh, the largest the largest army that they're commanding in the Mexican War would be like a corps. Yeah, right. So, you know, and that was one general who happened to oversee the entire army. Uh -huh. It isn't it isn't, you know, your typical officer who moves up to be a brigadier general who's all of a sudden overseeing much larger numbers of men. Sure. I and, mean, a lot of these guys when during the Mexican War might have been lieutenants or captains, maybe majors. But now here they're colonels and generals uh, of much larger bodies of troops. And, you know, it, maybe managing a unit is essentially the same. The only thing that changes is the size of it. But the the role of a colonel and or the role of a general it, it comes with more responsibilities that a captain never has and autonomy of fighting when you start talking about yeah. these larger units and holding them together and organizing and maintaining them um it's it's really night and day yeah and, and then the environment obviously you're fighting in a completely different environment um so so it's really it really is a different period um of time it's it's really that it's really that period of time between the Mexican War and the Civil War that we see just this dramatic transformation in in overall the entire world. And this is something I like talking to my students about is, so for 99, oh, almost 100% of human history, it's like 99.9% .9 of all human history, 
everything is essentially static. Uh, the, 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 the fact that where you grow up is where your grandkids are going to grow up, where mm-hmm. your great-grandkids grow up. You're probably going to be farmers. You're going to, you know, where, 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 where your son digs a little hole in the ground and puts seeds, his great-grandchildren are probably going to be doing the same thing. And his daughter, who's going to, you know, stay around the house and, 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 and have children, um, the traditional, like, long-time role of women, right, is going to stay that way forever. So um, technologically, you see innovations happen not in the now. I mean, we have innovations happen in a week, right? Two weeks. Your iPhone seems to be obsolete the second that you get it. Um, you, you're talking about eras, entire eras of time where the transformation may be the shape of an arrowhead. I mean, it's, mm. it, 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 it's, it's amazing that truly for, for all this period of time, there's virtually no technological innovation. So um, the number of calories people eat stays completely stagnant. The type of governance stays completely stagnant. And well, so, go, so when you say the number of calories people eat, um, go, go a little more into that if you can. Yeah. So I'm basically you, you, you ate what you grew and or, or, or however far that you could go maybe within horse horse distance. So if there was a local famine, if there was any sort of local issue um, or you lost your farm or whatever happens, right, um, you're going to have a really hard, hard time, right? Um, and the most you're going to be able to eat is what you're able to grow essentially yourself. And by the way, you're probably eating a very limited type of food because you're going to be eating whatever the crops are and whatever types of poultry or, or food that you can, you know, uh, animals that you can raise. Um, it's very all local and, and very sta- – it's it's stable, not necessarily from the good perspective, but stable in terms of you're not getting anything from the outside. I mean, most people never saw a banana or an orange, right, for their entire lives. Mm-hmm. You know, generations where people didn't know what these things were because they weren't being shipped. Right. Um, suddenly, when you hit this period of time that we're talking about in the mid-1800s, steamships, right, so steam propulsion – Railroads. Well, now, like food is where you where you you can have a famine in one part of a of a, of a country of the country, and take the food that's being produced elsewhere and put it on trains mm. and have mm. it have it be shipped somewhere else. Yeah, huge difference. And and ships as well. So so you can actually transport food, but not not just food. Every sort of technology and goods and service you can you can move it and you can expand the railroad. From, you know, from New York out to San Francisco, you can do these things and create and generate all of this new technology and transformation. And of course, that's happening in Europe as well at the same time with all this competition that's happening. So processing the food, too, is probably becoming more easy or or easier to do. Right. I mean, the con- this is the, the beginning of the plumping right? of America. It is really, yeah, it really is. And so, you know, well, the cotton, cotton as an industry looked like it was going to absolutely die here because the amount of labor it took to be able to to pick the cotton right and get the seeds out, it was it was uh, it was not very uh, affordable from a human perspective, right? And then you get the cotton gin. And suddenly now that's what, of course, generates the slave population to be so big is now all of a sudden cotton grows to be this enormous, um, the, the, this enormous uh, sellable good from the south. All of this happens. Right. And, and by the way, that if you had a cotton gin, but you didn't have trains or ships that could easily ship all this, all these bales of cotton, it wouldn't have been all that really beneficial either. So. The, the transportation and the, uh, the, another thing here, too, you get the um, the telegraph, mm. so the ability to transport and communicate information, but that also explodes newspapers. Mm-hmm. So now newspapers are, are, are growing, right? And because people are now getting information from all over the place. So it's not just what happened in your local town. Who wants to read about, you know, Jill and Billy getting married at the local church? But now suddenly you're hearing about what's happening in Washington. You're hearing news from what's happening in London. You're getting all of this information, which itself also becomes transformed. The technology from Europe makes its way over here. Our technology moves over there. So all of these things are happening at this period of time. And so for 99% of human history, when it comes to warfare, warfare was fought on essentially two planes. For, for all of human history, it's there, there's the ground warfare, and that is, of course, starting out with how far you could throw a rock or a spear or something. But until you get to really long-range artillery, it never really gets beyond, you know, uh, uh, the non-rifled musket still is, 
you could almost throw that far. Mm-hmm. My son could throw a baseball that far. So, um, it, you know, really, it's 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 you're talking distances of 50, 100 yards for most of human history, 99 percent of human history. Um, or for a good part of that history, too, it's it's surface warfare with ships. And that's you put a sail on it. Now, when did sailboats really go away? Well, it happened with the steam, steam engine. Sure. So so for, again, a large part of human history. Um, in terms of warfare, you it was what could you launch from a ship, right? So you would you 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 you'd get a ball and you'd roll it in grease, you'd light it on fire, and you'd catapult it at another ship or something. Um, not very far. So it's really all extremely static for ninety nine percent of human history, and then it's right at this period of time that the Civil War happens, and, and you have a couple of wars in Europe that happen at the same time. The Austro, um, Austro-Prussian War and the, the Franco-Prussian War happen right around, of course, the, Austro- or the Franco-Prussian War happening right after the Civil War. But it's all happening at the same time. So we go from two domains of warfare, now we have seven domains. Mm. We've added five domains of warfare since the Civil War, which when, you know, it seems like a long period of time, gee, you know, 160 years or whatever, it seems like a long period of time, but relative to all of human history, it's, it's not, happened in a blink of an eye. Yeah. And during the Civil War, you're going to add subsurface warfare as a domain, submarine warfare, the first, you know, the first effort, the first attempts um, to do that. You're adding aerial warfare in the establishment of now manned balloons going up and mm-hmm. collecting intelligence and directing artillery fire. Um, you have some of the first initial attempts to do um, – a little bit wider spread uh, weapons of mass destruction. It, it falters and it doesn't really come out there. It's not until World War I that that really happens. Um, but the bottom line is when we, when we say how do we go from two domains of warfare to the seven domains of warfare that we have today, J.F.C. Fuller, um, a British, one of the big British historians and the first developer of essentially tank warfare in World War I, um, he looks as a British war for, as a British officer. I think this is interesting um, that instead of looking at his own country, which has its own rich military history, uh, he writes Grant and Lee, the book Grant and Lee, which is a, a fantastic book on leadership and 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 transformation. And he's the one who would tell you that the Civil War was the first transformational, that first really big transformational yeah, sure. moment in military history. So, um, for me, the Civil War. When, when we get to Gettysburg and we talk about the changes that happen at Gettysburg, um, it's, to me, much more part of just this period of time where everything is changing. And, and I like to talk to people now about, you know, we look at and we say, oh, my gosh, it's so transformational now. Like, we have all these stovepipe systems in the Department of Defense, all these new, you got hypersonic and cyber warfare and stealth and AI and all these new things that are popping up. That, that people say, I don't know how to handle all these unique challenges. Things are exploding, all this technology. It's extremely difficult. But, I mean, it's not – so, so the, 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 implica- the global implications are bigger. But it isn't unlike that first instance of warfare in the Civil War of having to suddenly figure that now we have tur- we're going to have turreted warships soon. We're going to have submarines soon. We're going to have balloons in the air. We're going to have rifled artillery that now can, can – can, you know, fire much greater distances with much greater accuracy so that we're not just standing and throwing, you know, like how far can you throw something? You're truly talking about how many thousands of meters then you can start impacting your adversary mm. before you have to get in their face. And and some things are going by the wayside because of this too, because you simply can't take that 99% of human history and keep it going with all the transformations that happen. So the bayonet, right? The bayonet essentially disappears during this period of warfare. Um, sorry, Chamberlain lovers, but that's that's the simple fact: is the is the bayonet <laughs> disappears as a as as a real factor in warfare. Um, the defensive becomes the stronger of the two, whereas Napoleonic warfare and before it had been largely the offense was the stronger of hmm. the two. If you could get as many men or more than your enemy and charge across the field and yell louder and so on and get that psychological edge. Um, that had a real momentous power. And now, and, and this is where Gettysburg is transformational, right? You start using trenches and you start using um, more deniable fortifications. And suddenly it's the defensive now where instead of one to one or maybe slightly more, maybe 1.2, 1.3 men on the defensive per one attacker. Now you're talking having to have three to four men on offense to be able to successfully carry a field. Mm. 
um, which is why you get to World War World War One, the type of numbers that you have to need. Um, you're talking three to four people on the, on the offensive to be able to carry the to to be able to defeat a strong defensive force. So it's really this period of time that to me is so interesting because they went through many of the same challenges in terms of thinking through how we're going to do things that we're thinking about today. So since we're a Gettysburg show, uh, well, no, before we get to, to Gettysburg. Listen to the rest of this interview and dozens like it. Support the show and get early access to special episodes, early and discounted ticket sales, and more. The second lieutenant level and above gets access to all monthly Patreon episodes. So please go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, choose a tier, and join. And I thank you in advance.